Good afternoon. Colin responds, good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Orellana. I'm the director of the Office of Community Partnerships at UMass Boston. I'm also on the BLM Day uh, Committee. And uh, for those of you who are just joining us, I want to welcome you to the second annual BLM Day. I have the honor of facilitating this afternoon's feature panel of some of Boston's most prominent black leaders to discuss together unapologetically black self-determination. Black Lives Matter and black power movements are about a resistance to dominant systems and structures that seek to oppress and dare I say annihilate black people, black culture, and blackness. It is also about a radical self-love in a society that, as James Baldwin used to say, teaches black people to hate themselves from the time they are born. It is also about making space, demanding justice, centering the black experience, and not asking permission to do what is needed or what is right for black people, or apologizing for being black or focusing on black people's needs, their strengths, and their promise. Today's featured panel includes Sheena Collier, founder and CEO of Boston Wild Black and the Collier Connection. Sheena is a super connector. Yes, applause. <laughs> Sheena is a super connector, a convener, and a strategic planner. 16 years ago, she came to Boston to attend Harvard University Graduate School of Education and after attending Spelman College in Atlanta. And as a black woman, Sheena struggled to feel a sense of belonging at school and in this city. She didn't know anyone or have a network, so she built one. Sheena started and joined organizations, became civically engaged, and hosted events that connected her to lots of different worlds, including education, politics, the arts, community organizing, and business. She made connections that changed her life and learned techniques to navigate this city. This has helped her build a broad network that she now leverages to benefit others. With 15 years experience in education, economic development, community organizing, and event planning, she uses her ability to navigate different environments to broker partnerships within and across sectors. Shagun Adu, president and CEO of BACMA, Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, was raised in Boston and is a proud product of the Boston Public Schools. Following his graduation from Boston Latin Academy, he earned his Bachelor of Arts in History from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Following his 2012 graduation, Shagun joined the office of then District 4 City Councilor Charles Yancey. And after two successful years, he transitioned to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. At the same time, Shagun also organized the Boston Police Camera Action Team in 2014 with fellow high school graduate Shikia Scott. The mission of the community group was to further accountability and safety in Boston through the mandatory use of body-worn cameras by police. The Boston Globe did a feature story this year on Shagun and described him as, quote, distinguished from other young activists by a particular focus on economic empowerment as the solution to the long-time racial injustices that both COVID-19 and the death of George Floyd and other black people at the hands of police have laid to bear. Amari Paris Jeffries, executive director of King Boston, brings a wealth of experience into this role from the nonprofit management side, community activism, education reform, and social justice sectors. And he has served in executive roles at the, at the Parenting Journey, Jumpstart, Boston Rising, and Friends of the Children. 
Many of you know Amari, as he is one of the trustees of the UMass system. He's also a three-time graduate of UMass Boston and is my fellow cohort mate in the UMass Boston Higher Education PhD program. And last but not least, Willie Bodrick III. Sorry, the second. <laughs> um, Willie is the senior pastor of the historic 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury. Willie leads in a dynamic way, preaching, insightful teaching, and doing community-driven work throughout the country. Willie is the is the only is only the 14th, sorry, senior pastor of the 12th Baptist Church, which celebrates 180 years as a congregation and 215 years since the founding of their mother church, the African Meeting House. Willie's work has extended beyond the four walls of the church. He has served on the transition teams, steering committee for the Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins, as the outreach coordinator in the Community Engagement Division of the Massachusetts House Office, sorry, of the Attorney General Maura Healy, and as a senior advisor for the successful Ed Markey campaign for the United States Senate in, 2000, in 2020. He has extensive experience doing work in the community, including advocacy on issues of public education, public safety, and economic justice serving as president and chairperson of the Boston Network for Black Student Achievement and a member of the Boston School's Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force. Please join me in welcoming my friends, Sheena, Shagoon, Amari, and Willie. Just checking to make sure the microphone's working. Thank you. Give it up for the DJs. So I just want to start off uh, by welcoming each and every one of you to your public research university, UMass Boston. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I also wanted to start off by congratulating you because each of you have been getting several awards. Uh, and most recently, you were featured on the Boston Foundation's report last year, and you were featured as the change that we need. And all four of you have made it on the Boston Business Journal's lists. Willie, you made it on the 40 under 40, and Sheena, Shagun, and Amari on the Power 50. And there's so many other headlines and recognitions, I can't keep up with it. And it would take a long time to get through them on this stage today. So I just wanted to say congratulations for the recognition that you're receiving for all the hard work that you're putting into our community. So each of you has been invited specifically for this panel for a purpose. This panel is actually crafted with each of you in mind. Um, you are all highly regarded specifically for doing this work in the city of Boston. You are this generation, my generation's leaders of anti-black racism which really deals with these legacies of past and current oppressive conditions that the community has been dealing with. And beyond anti-blackness, anti-black racism, I see you also as leaders of what I'm gonna call black futurism. I didn't coin that term, that term actually exists, but the way I'm defining it is as people who are really focused on the fulfillment of the promise of black people. So I'm wondering if you can share with us um, what it means for you to do anti-racist work and what we might call this black futuristic work at this time in our history and in Boston. So any of you who want to pick this up. I'll, I'll jump at that first. Good, good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be with each and every one of you, and I bring greetings from the historic 12th Baptist Church. Cynthia, thank you for all the work that you've done to put this great panel together, and we're so excited to be here. Uh, I like the way that you began this conversation speaking about black futurism uh, and, and the studies of Afrofuturism, because I think the ways in which we must think about anti-racist work, it starts with imagination. It starts with being able to see what is beyond before it is yet realized. And I think what we must do is also give homage to those who've dreamed and imagined before we even came to be. Like there's no panel of us without those who've had a past and had a history to see beyond the edges of the mountain and say one day we'll get over that hill, we'll get over those struggles, and we're consistently fighting. And so I think the beginning of this work starts with how do we reimagine what we hope to become? What world do we want our children to be in? What world do we want this city to exist in? And how do we manifest that in the reality, in the now? And I think it starts by laying that groundwork. Uh, I'm so blessed to, to lead a church. We're 181 this year and 216. And that's a beautiful thing because you can see the history of this church who was considered the fugitive slave church uh, during the civil uh, the Underground Railroad and, and thought about as the church that was fighting on the forefront of the civil rights movement. It was the place where Dr. King worked. And so we have this framework of liberative work. And the question is, how do we, as, and I, as young people, I'll still say, I'm gonna hold on to it. Uh, <laughs> as young folks, right, uh, work towards making that real in Boston. And I think it starts with reimagining community as my colleagues are doing, reimagining how do we do business in this city, reimagining what does healthy and whole, wholesome, wholeness look like in this city. And I pray that that's what we're doing through the spiritual foundation as well as the work that we're doing in the community. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Um, you know, also thank you for having us here. Um, for me to have a conversation with folks I love talking to anyway. Um, just to build off of, of what um, Willie said, so the, the vision statement of Boston Wild Black is reimagining cities where black people can thrive by making black experiences, community, and culture more prominent and abundant. And I think um, I love as well that you started out talking about the future because I think to stay committed to this work, you have to um, stay in a place of re uh, reimagining because the day-to-day -day can be very discouraging. We continue to see things that um, I think make us all question, you know, how much of this is possible. And so we name, we have a series called Black Boston Reimagine. Like we just, we use that terminology a lot. And um, really because even for myself to keep going as the leader of the organization, um, of members and staff, I have to keep myself in that place um, to keep myself going. I, I have to believe that there is something possible beyond what we all can see right now. Um, and to Willie's point, someone dreamed this for us. You know, even um, my parents, I have seven older siblings, and so my parents are um, in their 70s and eight, my father's passed, but he was 80. He was at the March on Washington. My mother was at Selma, and so they, can't, they couldn't even fathom the things that I'm doing now, the access that I have now, the conversations that I'm able to be in. Like it's, they, they're proud. You know when your parents like don't really know what you do? They're like, we're proud of you. I, I don't, I can't quite wrap my head around it, but um, it seems very kind of um, abstract to them um, because they were just fighting for basic survival and needs. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to do that. For me specifically through my work, a lot of it is focused on black people feeling like fortifying us, you know, so that we can be in these spaces, so that we can take up more space um, in places that we're not traditionally in, so that we can create our own and own our own spaces. Um, but really the core of it is like us feeling good about ourselves and celebrating being black, um, seeing it as an asset, seeing, uh, seeing ourselves reflected um, in this city that we know that that sometimes is a challenge. And, uh, you know, there I get asked sometimes about almost like am I, by creating a separate space, um, in a sense, am I recreating the issues that already exist? And for me, I, I genuinely really believe that we have to be fortified to be able to be in community with each other um, and with, with other folks. 
And so really taking the time first to um, figure out how we see ourselves, um, how we relate to each other, um, so that then we can continue to fight these fights that we have to fight together. But a lot of it starts with us, you know, kind of reimagining how we're in community with each other. I don't know if you guys had anything you wanted to add. Um, or I have another question for you. <laughs> Please see above. <laughs> so, so some of the things I'm hearing has to do with the wholeness, establishing wholeness. You're talking about restoration. We're talking about imagination. It makes me wonder, has there been any non-negotiables for you all in being able to realize these things, this imagination, this wholeness, this restoration? And have there been compromises, perhaps, in being able to do this work? Well, um, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. There we go. Um, I feel like uh, the secretary, when she went into the, uh, is this on? All right. Um, and she said hello. Um, but great to see everybody here. I want to thank, of course, the chancellor uh, for being here for this conversation. And um, before I even say anything, I know we've started answering some of these questions, and you all gave us a round of applause. Uh, but the four of us are here because of our friendship and support of Cynthia. And so I just want to take like five seconds to also applaud the work that Cynthia has been doing uh, here at the university. So when I think of um, uh, non-negotiables, uh, in the work that I do, um, so I lead uh, uh, BECMA, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, and when I first started working with the organization, I had a lot of people coming up to me saying, why do you have to be the Black Economic Council? Why can't you be the Minority Economic Council or the People of Color, you know, some organization that includes uh, everybody and doesn't um, uh, exclude people uh, based on the name? So the non-negotiable for me was keeping it as Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. Because uh, when, even when we think about the 60s, um, or just the history of black people in this country, anytime we fight for black people, everybody benefits. But I cannot find a time in history when it's been the reverse and black people benefit, right? And so for me, the non-negotiable is when I'm in a room, I'm talking about black people specifically, but knowing that everybody, including white people, uh, benefit when we are eliminating barriers for black people. And so, you know, I won't go even more into it, but I'm just saying that the non-negotiable is black-focused, knowing that uh, uh, everybody winds up benefiting from, from that advocacy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I think my mic is working. Uh, um, I, I also want to thank the chancellor for being here for this conversation, Dr. Cooper, uh, Cynthia, who, who is a dear friend and, and, and uh, colleague and, and study partner, uh, and, and my friends on the stage and all of you for being here today. You know, I, I, when I think about non-negotiables in this moment, one of the things that I think at least the four of us and, and so many so many more of us who, who are a part of, of this work has been to, to not make this about any of us individually. Um, this is probably, at least for me, someone who, who has had the privilege of doing this work for a while, seeing so many folks who are doing this work that are actually genuinely friends and actually genuinely care for each other and that, at least of our generation, not trying to uh, sabotage, not trying to uh, elbow each other out, but really thinking about the many ways in which racism racism impacts black folks. Because we each do different things, uh, we each do the same thing, uh, and we're stronger together. And I think that's been a non-negotiable for me. Um, anytime that I have had an opportunity uh, to speak or to, to share something or to uh, move something forward, I have not done it alone in, th in, this, in this movement. I've always asked someone uh, to be a co-partner, uh, friend, ally, influencer with me in the moment. So it's, that's been non-negotiable because I think white supremacy has a way of uh, making this about special Negroes who do special things uh, one thing at a time. And I think this has been a moment where uh, we, we have rejected this notion of uh, the, these special unicorn folks, special unicorn leaders who, who have galvanized uh, people and movements alone by themselves in a, in a silo. And so I think it's, it's been uh, an extreme non-negotiable for me in this moment. Could, could I just touch on that? Because I think they, they kicked off an interesting piece. Um, I also believe 
a non-negotiable has to be not compromising our blackness when we walk in in different rooms. Um, I've been in rooms where people say different things to different crowds at different times to appease those people to get their ultimate ends. And I think it's a danger when we do that because we end up compromising the breadth of the blackness that is represented. And it, it creates those anomalies of who ends up speaking for everybody when it doesn't really capture uh, with any real understanding the depth of all of who we are. And so I think sort of leading in a sense of walking into spaces to not erase myself. Uh, I, I'm very intentional about not trying to make you feel that comfortable of how I speak. I speak the way I speak. It's not going to change. I'm OK with that. Um, I'm very comfortable with actually engaging these narratives that ex explore the breadth of the black community, the black stories, those that have been erased, and those in which we don't like to talk about, and making sure that those stories are lifted up as well. Because we can tell the stories of the elites, but we don't really get to the deep understanding of what's needed in lifting and positioning other people to not speak for them, but let them speak for themselves. And so I think what's important for us in this next iteration of leadership, this next generation traveling through the city is to bring ourselves wholly into these spaces and ensure that we don't erase other stories while trying to tell a story for other black folks. Um, and, and not to um, uh, hog more airtime on this specific question, but the other non-negotiable I think of for myself, uh, and I think really for all of us, uh, you know, we talked about Reverend Bodrick and, and 12th Baptist. I grew up on the second pew of 12th Baptist Church. And I think of the work of Reverend Hester, Michael Haynes, Arthur Gerald, and now how it's present in our current pastor, so the, the other non-negotiable for me, thinking of the work that they did uh, in, in, we talked about the future, right? Uh, doing everything we can for future generations. But right now the non-negotiable on my end is about time because the way we operate in this country is, um, you know, I had a breakfast uh, before this and we were talking about how uh, there were, uh, oh, you know, in Boston for white people in the business world, there will be someone that has nothing today and tomorrow they, have a whole huge development project worth hundreds of billions of dollars uh, pop up out of nowhere. That could only happen for really a white man. Uh, but with black people, it's like, well, if you do X, Y, Z for however long, maybe in 20 years, we'll get to a point where there are black people um, that have the capacity and the money to do whatever. And I am not settling for that. I mean, I'm 33 right now. Uh, I've got nieces that are uh, 14 and nine. Uh, if, if they are 18 years old, uh, in the streets about the same thing that we've been in the streets about, I have failed and so has the city. And so for me, the other non-negotiable is someone trying to tell me what we cannot do uh, in one or two years, knowing the long history of this state, of this city, of when we put our minds to it, we, we get stuff done in days, weeks, months. We just got a vaccine to a global pandemic in less than a year. So I know that we can when we put our minds to it, uh, we can uh, accomplish a lot of the things that we've been talking about for hundreds of years in this country. And so I'm, I, my non-negotiable is also 20 years from now, I swear I'm going to be pissed off if we're still talking about uh, the stuff that we're talking about on this stage, particularly to my job, like less than 1%. If I hear that phrase ever again about black people in anything, less than 1% of participation, of uh, when it comes to wealth, et cetera, uh, it's intentional, and the city, the state, whatever, cannot say that we've done our best because on any other issue that we care about uh, collectively, we, at the snap of a finger, uh, achieve it. So, you know, the other non-negotiable is time. Before we die, we need to see and realize what we're fighting for right now. And you have many years ahead of you. <laughs> Decades ahead. Um, my next question just kind of folds off of this conversation. I, I see each of you as the embodiment of what it means to be unapologetically black and what it means to do self-determined work. Each of you is walking the, the talking the walk, walking the talk. I'm horrible at colloquials. <laughs> it's all good, right? Um, but each of you is really walking the talk. The way you see the world, the way that you're experiencing the world is unapologetically black. And you talked about these non-negotiables, but it makes me wonder if you can share more about how you define for yourself what does it mean 
to be unapologetically black? And how is this actually manifesting through your work and through your personal lives? Mm -hmm. um, well, so the, the name Boston While Black, um, many people, including black people, have asked me about changing because it feels to in people's face. And um, is, you know, it's interesting when it comes from black people. I think that they are, they feel like they're being helpful or protective, uh, but not really realizing that um, my non-negotiable is centering whiteness and white people. And, and so I think that, um, you know, that I, I joke and say, as I get older, I feel like I'm getting blacker, um, but meaning I'm just more comfortable, you know, in what it means for me. Um, and that includes naming something, putting very much out front kind of what my mission is. So if you ask for a meeting with me, there's a whole like intro conversation we don't even need to have because you, you already know um, who I'm representing, kind of what I'm, um, who and what I'm advocating for. Um, I think, you know, at a granular, granular level, um, the way that I'm building the team and community that I have. So for my team, for example, my staff, we start our, every Monday, we're gonna do it this afternoon, that we open up saying, what are, what are black people talking about this week? And everyone has to bring something from the shade room, from CNN, from like you have to be tapped into kind of what is, cause you know, every week there's something new that folks are talking about. Um, but the reason that I started doing it was even to give my staff permission to show up. My staff is, um, is black, is all black, because I could tell coming from, you know, they all come from working at um, mostly um, predominantly white institutions. They didn't really believe at first that they could really be themselves in the space. And I had to really give them permission to say, I know you're talking about this stuff with your friends, like you actually can talk about it here. You know, this is part of the black experience. Be professional, <laughs> but you know, there's, this is part of being black as well. And it feels, you know, many awards and accolades and panels, but honestly, the, the piece of it that feels the most rewarding to me is giving that permission to people to show up as themselves. This, these five folks that I supervise right now, like that is the most rewarding thing to me every week um, and really helps me to continue to feel more comfortable showing up as my black self, um, but extending that space to them as well. And similarly to what's been said, when I go into other spaces, I'm the same person. You know, I, when I still had a job, um, I would, well, when I had a job, you know, that, you know, I didn't have such a great boss when I had other jobs. Um, I, um, I would find little ways to do it. So, you know, I might have on a business suit, but like some door knocker earrings or, um, you know, there would just be these little really kind of, um, symbols are reminders to myself of who I am um, and, and what I represent. I also felt like part of it was showing people in these spaces that black people, a black woman with bamboo earrings on and et cetera, et cetera, um, knows what she's doing and can lead this meeting. And I, and I felt like it was also helping to change. I'm not really into minds and hearts changing. That's not my, my, my goal right now, but you know, giving people a little bit of a, um, starting to shift the way that they think and, and who they even associate as kind of the, the black people, the unicorns um, that they feel like are um, the people that, you know, the, what is the word, the articulate black folks are, are the folks that they, they wanna be in relationship with. So it's a, it's a very freeing, I think it, I wanna say there is some privilege in it. I did go to Selman and Harvard. I have had really great jobs. So, you know, I do feel like I have this almost space to be my black self because I have these other things kind of backing up who I am in a sense. And so I'm able to move with a little freedom. Like I always say, like, I'm employable. Like, so, you know, it kind of gives me this attitude of like, I'm employable, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be who I am here because I'll find something else if I need to. And, and I recognize the privilege in, be, in being able to do that. And some people can't show up like that. You know, they, they do have to um, code switch or the other things that folks have to do because they may not have the relationships or the um, degrees and all that. So there is still some privilege, I think, sometimes in being authentically black. 
So you all talked about generations. Um, Willie, you were talking about folks in the church and the generations that really led the 12th Baptist Church and the fact that it's a historical church. And you've talked about standing on the shoulder of giants. So who are some of these older generations that you look up to or who have inspired you in your work? And also, who are some of the folks from this newer generation that you're also looking up to? At first, I was going to say Amari, but I said I wouldn't do him like that. <laughs> no, uh, Amari, the older generation? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I speak about, um, I think when you talk about unapologetically black, um, I like to always say that we're not the first people to do this. Um, I don't like the mantra or the ideas that um, this generation is doing something so novel that we're just the blackest of the blackest and the smartest of the smartest, and it's actually not true, right? There have been people who have gone way beyond what even many of us have done to actually push the culture, push our ideas, to create the space for us to even talk about being unapologetically black. Um, I was blessed to be born and raised in Southwest Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I'm a kid, I'm an APS kid, Atlanta Public Schools kid. And so I grew up in a city where my whole life I had a black mayor, my whole life I had a black congresswoman. I had my whole life I had black female doctors, uh, my whole life I had black teachers. And so I grew up with a reaffirmation from my parents and my communities that, that who you are is enough. Like who you are can do whatever you want to or imagine. And I think that was the privilege I grew up with because I met other black folks across the country when I went to college and I recognized that they didn't have that freedom. They didn't have that liberty. And so when I came to this city, I'm so thankful for people like Reverend Arthur T. Gerald who poured into me. I'm thankful for uh, you know Reverend Dr. Charles Adams out of Detroit who was my professor over at Harvard Divinity School. I'm thankful for Charles Ogletree who literally took me in and, and made me one of his own and, uh, and I thank God for him each and every day. Um, I'm thankful for Charlotte Gola Ritchie for giving me an opportunity to just run from church to church and drop literature. I'm thankful for so many people who, uh, you know, Barbara Fields, who is an education advocate, uh, George Cox, uh, John Mudd, there's so many people I can name who have laid that foundation. And then as a student of history, Shagun Loren, the list of all the pastors of TVC. And so we've been so blessed. Uh, I think about Reverend Jeffrey Brown, who's done so much to pour into me. And so their names, I'm pretty sure all of us will name, Mel King and others who just took the time. Uh, Steve Wright, Attorney Wright, Steve Wright, who just took the time and said, they're gonna pour into me. And I, I know that I'm all that I am today. And many of you all could say the same, that you are who you are because somebody said, I'm gonna give you that time, I'm gonna give you that tutelage, I'm gonna give you the love that either somebody gave me or somebody did not give me, but I'm gonna make sure you have it. And so those are some of the people that come to mind uh, immediately. Well, um, <clears throat> I think this is, a, this is an, a great question, especially after the, uh, our definition of uh, what it means to be unapologetically black, because what informs it is the idea that we are not descended from a fearful people. Um, and, and the fact, first of all, that black people are here is the miracle in itself because of how the world has for generations tried to destroy our people. And the fact that everything that we've ever been through, we still continue to produce genius and excellence uh, despite insurmountable odds, I think, um, uh, well, but so when I think of generations uh, that inform this work, I mean, everywhere I go, I always talk about my grandfather, uh, Reverend Earl Lawson, who was a pastor in Malden, um, who certainly everything I'm doing today is informed by my conversations and sitting at his feet and learning about his involvement in the civil rights revolution, his working with Virgil Woods uh, here in Massachusetts and, and uh, leading um, uh, on that side through the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and getting folks involved. And so hearing the stories that you don't learn in, uh, in high school or middle school about what the civil rights revolution actually was. It was more than black people and white people marched around America seven times and the walls of racism came tumbling down. Uh, <laughs> but rather, you know, that there was, I mean, again, this is to, to Reverend Bodrick's point, um, you know, death threats, people actually died. Uh, you know, like what we're doing right now, uh, you know, 50 years ago, you know, there could be lynch mobs outside in certain parts of this country. Um, and so we could not be, and so that's an excellent point to make. So I think of my grandfather, those that came before us who are still with us today. I think of Sarah Ann Shaw here in, in Boston, uh, Melnia Cass, who's no longer with us. I think of Alfreda Harris, 
um, um, uh, Chuck Turner. I mean, there are so many folks. Like Boston's black history is so rich, and yet we rarely talk about it. Um, and you know, I, I appreciate my brother uh, Imari here leading King Boston. And to his point about uh, the magic Negroes, like those are the folks that we focus on all the time and we don't get into, I mean, you just think about all the movements that were led in just the 60s alone, um, the Mothers uh, for Adequate Welfare, and the fact that they shut down um, Grove Hall when the welfare office was uh, in, in what's now the Grove Hall Mall um, because they weren't getting paid what they were supposed to and they shut that place down for days uh, and, and no one knew what to do with them and then they got what they were pushing for. I mean, the, just the, like the, the local history in Boston that feeds the activism we see happening today um, is really important. And then, you know, of course, there are the folks that are here um, today, those, you know, in the Black Lives Matter Boston movement, um, you know, all the folks on this stage. Um, so Armani White, uh, I'm trying to think of some other um, young folks who are really leading on the ground. And, you know, I, I feel bad that I can't um, list everybody right now at the top of my head. Um, Black Boston Black, 2020 uh, is a group yeah, yeah, that, that's, right, that's, that's really, right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> really yeah, yeah. active. That's right, that's right. Um, and I, I think that the, um, the interesting thing and even all the folks that you all just mentioned, you know, when you're learning history, it feels like those people were always old. Um, but you realize how much, even for them, young people have always been leading a lot of these things. And, you know, we're kind of like OGs. Uh, you know, there's, um, you know, <laughs> even I look to folks who are younger to me to really, um, around the direction, you know, what are the things, because, you know, the, the, the fact is, the older that you get, you get, you know, we got mortgages and houses, and yet your, your uh, willingness to take risks gets lower and lower. Um, and so continuing to be informed by people who are younger and who are really um, seeing things differently, you know, and, and really understand um, the injustices that you might even, you know, be starting to become kind of immune or blind to. Um, and so really letting young people lead that um, on, a, on a totally separate, I mean, related to your question, but different than the answer is giving. Someone who I really look to because I'm building a business is Issa Rae. And, and one of the, the main reason is this, you know, I came here to get my master's in education and was in community organizing all that for years. But the idea around creating jobs for black people and creating businesses, business models that, that center blackness, that's like a very new concept to me. I, I'm not saying it's new, but it's a new concept to me. Um, and watching the way, not you know, necessarily insecure itself, but just watching the way she's building a business and a platform for black people to be themselves, um, a staff of black folks, like putting black, uh, funding black people's dreams, like that to me is, um, really the ultimate um, goal and dream of this. Um, the question you asked earlier about everybody shared their non-negotiables, no one shared any compromises. Well, well <laughs> one compromise I, that I struggle with is all this black futurism I'm doing is mostly funded by white people. And I have to spend a lot of time convincing people who um, are not as close to it why they should fund it, why they should resource it. And my, my dream is that, you know, there comes a time when black people are really funding our own dreams and funding our own movements and, and us being able to fund each other. I just love all this. Yes. No, I'll, I'll, I'll add on um, to, to some of my inspirations because I, I see one in the back. Um, I started going to UMass uh, when I was 19 years old. And so this is like a second home to me almost. Uh, round in the corner on, on 30 years. And when, when I came here as an undergraduate student, I was a, a Africana studies major. And so I see Dr. Kamara in the back, uh, one of my inspirations. So I want to shout him out. Also, also uh, Tony Vandermeer and, and Robert Johnson from that department. And, and you know, I think I, um, I, I, I cut my teeth on what it meant to be a part of the black intellectual tradition here. Um, and I, th I think it's oftentimes not talked about in our work. Um, and so I, wa I wanna shout out this university as one of the, one of the places that, that I draw inspiration from. I'm still here as a doctoral student, almost, almost 30 years. I feel like this place belongs to me when I walk through the campus uh, un unapologetically. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go anywhere in this campus because this is, this is a home. 
uh, more more black students graduate from this university than any other student any other school in this city and so this is an important institution but outside of the institution I would also uh, shout out uh, Hubie Jones who who is 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 a protege of Mel King uh, uh, Hubie Chuck Turner Byron Rushing were in the first class of community fellows uh, and and through that inspiration of, of being uh, in the first class of Mel King community fellows Hubie ran for com uh, Congress, and Byron Rushing and, 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 um, and Chuck Turner were his campaign managers. Now, he didn't win, but they, were, but they all learned a lot. And I think the inspiration from being in, in a cohort of people that push you to, to move forward is, is an inspiration. I learned a lot of those lessons from Hubie. And then, and then Robert Lewis Jr., who was also a trustee of, of this university, but um, you know, took me under his wings early on as a, as a mentor or a mentee. Um, and so, I, you know, th those are those are the folks that I that I find inspiration. It's always been a combination of uh, the academy and, and community, and, and really uh, this this um, this balance of, of combining knowledge with activism is is, is important. And I think, and you hear in all of our work. I really love that this this there was a history lesson today, right, about all the folks in Boston and our own great city. Because I think oftentimes we think of civil rights movement and we think of like the marches down south. We forget about the fact that, to your point, Sugar, and black Boston has been here and there's a rich history of people. I almost feel like we need to say their name t-shirt with all the folks that, that you mentioned that are just here from Boston. And speaking of Boston, I'm wondering if you can talk about what is happening in Boston and in the Commonwealth right now that you think is fertile ground for this kind of work. Well, I'll start. You know, Reverend, Reverend Barber talks about this third reconstruction. Really, the, the other two reconstructions happened. Uh, the first one happened, as we know, uh, right after World, uh, right after Civil War. Uh, the second one happened uh, when returning GIs returned from World War II up until right, 1968, 1967. And this is some, some argue Reverend Barber, who's the, at the NAACP president in North Carolina, um, and, and really founder of the new Poor People's Project talks about this being the third reconstruction. And, it, it, and reconstructions exist in three, three phases. Uh, there's uh, an emergence of elected and civic leaders, and so some might argue um, the, the election of Ayanna Presley and the black law enforcement leaders and the mayor and the DA and the attorney general uh, the emergence of those elected leaders are a part of the third reconstruction. The, the, three, the four of us uh, and others are a part of this, the civic emergence. The other two parts of the reconstruction are economic and social. And so in, in all three, in the earlier two reconstructions, um, they were never completed. Uh, they were reconstructions. They weren't um, constructions. So they, 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 they didn't happen. And so I think the emergence of leaders like us and the elected leaders are a part of this. And I think each and every one of us are working in the, the social space. Uh, I think particularly uh, Sheena, Willie and I, Reverend Bodrick and I are working more in the social space uh, and also in the economic space. I think uh, Shagun leads that and I think King Boston does some work in the economic space uh, led, led by Reverend Carrington who's, who's sitting over there. And so I think that's, that's some of the pieces to contextualize it, some of the pieces that we're experiencing. Um, and and I, think, I think many of us are looking at um, looking at this work over a decade. And so many of us are pointing to 2030, Boston's 400th birthday, um, as, a, as an indicator of change, right? And so thinking about 2020, the, the, the landing, the 400th anniversary of, of, of uh, the, the Mayflower and the Pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock, the really ground zero for the first displacement. And so Boston, Massachusetts, ground zero for displacing indigenous people. 10 years later after that original displacement, the community of Boston was founded. And so this decade has symbolic meaning to this area and to the country. Boston writes the country's history. And so I think that's how some of us have contextualized the moment that we're in. And I'll, I'll let you pass it on. No, I think that's a great start, Amari. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a, we'll be electing the next mayor tomorrow. Uh, so everybody, please get out and vote. Get out and this vote. is a PSA. Please, please, please get out and vote. Um, because I think a, a lot of what the future of the city will rest on who takes the helm of that office downtown. Uh, we're at an interesting juncture, and I think Amari has laid an excellent framework for us to think through it. Um, but, but the issues are there. They've been there. 
I think what happened, COVID actually exposed the exacerbation of these issues uh, in many a ways, whether it's the opportunity achievement gaps in our school systems, uh, whether it's been healthcare issues and the ways in which we've seen people fall through the social safety nets of our systems, uh, whether it be food insecurity, job insecurity, whether it be our brothers and sisters who are in South Bay or in other facilities and making us think critically about criminal justice. Uh, I'm so excited for the work that, that DA Rollins was doing, but there's more to be done, right? Uh, I'm excited for the work that we've been doing as a city to put more representative people that look more like the city in office, but there's more work to be done. And so I think right now, um, this city has to figure out who it wants to be. Um, is it gonna be a city that is truly thinking critically about the equity of the city so that um, Chagun doesn't feel like a failure, but the rest of us don't feel like a failure, where we hear that less than 1% of contracting through the city is going to black businesses? Uh, is it gonna be the issues that, um, that Sheena's working on where we don't have enough spaces and we're having to create these spaces? And how do we make sure that these spaces exist? Um, I always talk about, when we talk about imagination, I'm, I love the futurism framework because I believe being unapologetically black is affirming black ideas, affirming black consciousness, affirming black futures, affirming black business, affirming black institutions, and making sure that black bodies and black beings can exist wholly in every space in the city. And I don't think that exists right now. And so our job is to make sure that we're removing the barriers that we're lifting up people. And my, my goal in this work, uh, whether it is the work that we're doing spiritually, whether it's the work that we're doing communally, whether it's the work that we do as a church economically, is to prayerfully bring about wholeness so that all of our people might be free. Well, I, think, I love you all. I, I think too, you know, adding to that, um, uh, there's a, a I'm la laughing because um, what, what our group might say to this, but uh, I'm about to do a quote, yeah. There's a proverb that says that uh, to talk much and arrive nowhere is the same as climbing a tree to catch a fish. And there's many a redwood around Massachusetts. And uh, so when we talk about, um, you know, some of, the diff some of the movements that are inspiring, um, you know, we've talked, uh, Imari and Reverend Bodrick talked about uh, the civic and social aspect and, you know, First of all, there are a lot more people of color that are in these political spaces, which is I mean, for the first time in our history. And so now it's, uh, we are, it's incumbent on us to support them because just because you get a black person in a particular office doesn't mean, you know, first of all, our history is gone of racism, but also that they're just gonna do everything themselves. And you know, one name we haven't mentioned today is Mayor Kim Janey, who did an excellent job, in my opinion, uh, shepherding the city, you know, I mean, this year we, we, we will have three mayors this year. And, you know, uh, how she served uh, in between those two bookends, I think, has been incredible to see because what we could have had was someone who wasn't ready for that and we would not have dealt with the pandemic as we've dealt with it and, and essentially set up whoever comes in tomorrow for success. And so I just need to put that out there. Um, and by the way, where do I go? Where, where do I vote? MA.com. That's where all of you need to go after this if you, to find your polling location, those of you that are watching. Polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Happy to help you. Info at Beckma.org if you need support uh, voting. Anyway, but to answer this question, I, I want to I add to that, and I, I use that proverb in the beginning because um, there are, I, I feel like there is um, unspoken, but there is a redefinition of what power means in Massachusetts. Because a lot of times, it is, especially in Boston, it's centered on, politi on the political that it always matters who is on the fifth floor of City Hall, the mayor or the council, or it's mattered who's the congressperson is or who any of these elected positions is. And I think that a lot more people, particularly our generation and younger, are starting to understand that yes, that matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. And there's a lot more work on the ground to bring about the changes that we wanna see. A lot more coalitions that are forming. You got the Black Mass Coalition, the New Boston Coalition, so many others, not something that I saw happening when I was a kid. A lot of nonprofits and other groups operated in silos. And so that's why 50 years later, we see the statistics we see because everyone tries to be Superman. Everyone tries to do everything themselves. And today, really as a result of the pandemic, you see a lot more people working together use and, and combining their resources to address a problem. So, you know, we can go through a list of all the organizations and people who are doing great work, but I would say that the, the great, um, the framework that with, 
uh, with which it's happening is that people are redefining power and inserting themselves into that, um, but also people are working together, which is you know a point that Imari brought up too about, I mean, all of us, I mean, we're on our own text chain, you know, informing each other and supporting each other, and, and that's, um, that's not something you saw a lot when I was growing up here. Yeah. And you mentioned movement before, the word movement. So I'm gonna dip into this second to last question because I think we have like 10 more minutes Someone's out there probably, thank you, just <laughs> monitoring time for us. Um, but I actually looked up what the word movement means in the dictionary, so I'm gonna share that. The Merriam-Webster dictionary defines a movement uh, in several ways. One of the ways is that it's a process of moving. It's a tactical or strategic shift of a military unit. It's a series of organized activities that work toward an objective. And it can be a moving parts of a mechanism that transmit definite motion. The Urban Dictionary describes movement as, you know I had to do that. <laughs> the Urban Dictionary describes movement as the art of leading yourself and creating your own things and not being a copier or a biter. <laughs> so we're here because it's BLM Day at the university and uh, BLM is, is a movement, right? It was, it's a world movement uh, for black lives. I'm wondering if you can share um, as our second to last question, what is the movement that you're trying to build and how will you know if it's successful? What kind of worlds do you foresee? I can go. Oh, I know. <laughs> no, it's not, the, not 30 seconds left. We have like 10 minutes, we have 10 minutes, but. What, I'll rephrase it again. What, what is the movement that you are specifically trying to build? How do you know if it will be successful? And what world do you foresee? Well, I think, I think uh, a big part of this, this season that we're in is that we're able to kind of do this sort of vision casting. Uh, we keep putting on these numbers, 2030, 2040, I've heard as well. Um, and so we've kind of put a timeline on ourselves in some ways about what do we want to see. Um, a part of what I want to see is uh, I want to see our communities no longer be pushed out. I want to see, I want to see Roxbury stay Roxbury. Um, and people who live and work in that community have the ability to live and work in that community. Uh, I want to see a school system where Parents don't have to go outside of the city to educate their children uh, and feel comfortable and confident in each and every school that they put, put their children in. Uh, I want to see a city where uh, I don't have to go to Seaport or I don't have to go down to South End, which I like to go, uh, or I don't have to go downtown to, to be able to have all the amenities that are necessary so that the money that we're, that we're spending stays in my neighborhood. I would love for that to happen. Um, I, I would like to see a city where uh, the leadership is continually representative um, and where there are real opportunities for folks to get jobs uh, and that we're not making the same pitches to the same people. I want to see more things like Amari was able to do for 12 Baptist Church, where King Boston gave our church a million dollar gift for us to continue to do the work that we are doing. You ought to clap it up for Amari and his leadership. But I want to stop just casting dreams, but making them realities. And one of the things that I've always criticized Boston is that we're good with rhetoric that does not match our reality. And so I think now it is up to us to put the pressure where it needs to be applied. It is up to us to not just speak truth to power, but to take power and to make sure that we create the equity that we actually say that we want to see. And so I'm praying and working to make sure that this city is a city that is equitable, is a city that's representative, is a city whose infrastructure represents the broad breadth of this city, the breadth, the color of the city, the culture of the city, uh, and that hopefully uh, through the work of all of us that we're able to tell a different story to the nation and we're no longer seen as a racist city, but a city that's building a beloved community. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> I think you wrapped up all of our work well. Um, I would just add, I, you know, if I could 
kind of boil my work down to um, what is the movement. I think it's for black people to be seen. Right? I, I really think that that's the core of what I care about, what I'm pushing for, why I'm creating space for black people, um, and for us to live, work, play in places that are um, built for us to grow and thrive. And, and figuring out, you know, with, with all that uh, Reverend Broderick just said, like those are the elements, those are the things that were, will help us to grow and thrive to, to a point that the gun made earlier, not just for black people, <laughs> it's actually for everybody, but it's through the lens of black people um, because we know that when we're free, everyone's free. And so th that really is, um, is the movement um, there. I shared this, we had a mayoral forum the other night and one of the things that I shared was this quote that I, I saw somewhere one day and it's just followed me through life. So I have my own set of quotes and proverbs. Um, but it was that uh, safe and equitable spaces for black people is as economic as it is social. And so <laughs> a lot of times, <laughs> don't copy my quote, don't, yeah. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about, even when Boston Wild Black is talking about space, people do see it through a social lens. You know, we do create social gatherings and, you know, we talk about people having fun, but, but really it's about the economic thriving of black people. We know that when we have those social spaces and we're able to be in community, um, I mean, even on a, um, having the ability to connect with each other for jobs, for other type of opportunities, I mean, that's the, thing that's missing for us sometimes is having these na these spaces where we can connect to do business, to share ideas, to kind of ideate together. Um, and so I think that the more we have these types of spaces where we feel seen and heard and centered um, is, the, is, is the movement um, that I'm pushing for. Boston Wild Black is a way to do that and there are other ways to do that. So, um, and I think we all paused after you asked that question because it's, you know, It'll take more than the 10 minutes to, well, we can say our, what our movement is in like 30 seconds, but then putting everything under it would take maybe a half hour each. And, and I think you all want to stay here that long, right? Um, which would be about two hours here. But um, I want to, so the movement for us is it's economic, right? And I mean, at BECMA, we're trying to make black people money. That's, that's the 30 second. We're trying to make black people money, uh, especially in a city that has, and you know, on the, on the city side, Boston has a $3.675 billion budget that it puts out every year. Um, you have a state that has a $40 billion budget, but here in the city of Boston, there are trillions of dollars coming through this city. That's something that should be interesting to everybody in the room, doesn't matter what color you are, trillions of dollars because of all of the corporations that have their headquarters or some of their main offices right in the seaport or downtown or financial district of the city, trillions of dollars. Um, and so, and black people see very little of that. But I'm just, I'm just gonna say um, why it's important. Because a lot of times, you know, uh, Imari started talking about um, uh, the third reconstruction, and one thing that King Boston is leading here in Massachusetts um, is the conversation around reparations. And, you know, that word and the idea behind it kind of, some folks kind of bristle at it, like, well, you know, slavery was so long ago. You know, and, and it's funny, every time we talk about slavery, we add an extra 100 years. Oh, it was 700 years ago, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's like, no, it was, it was actually a little more recent than that. Um, but I, I wanna, you know, it's important that we're talking about this because again, as Sheena just said, it's not something that just impacts black people. The Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation put out a report earlier this year, I think it was um, August, and this is a conservative group. So I just wanna say that up front too. They, they are not in the business of, um, uh, making everybody look good, they, they, they're very conservative. And they put out a report on the racial wealth gap here in Massachusetts alone, and said that if we were to close the racial wealth gap in Massachusetts just between black and white people, we would add $25 billion to the state economy every single year, okay? That's not just something that benefits black people. That benefits everybody in this room, your families, your friends, your communities. Um, you know, and so for me, our movement is closing that racial wealth gap. Again, not just for the benefit of black people, but for all of our communities, because one thing that we understand at BECMA and up on this stage is that the development of some communities cannot coexist with the underdevelopment of others. You know, Tito Jackson, former city councilor, and now in the cannabis space has said a, a lot, he was the city councilor where Kim Janey is now, where was councilor, 
Roxbury, Back Bay, et cetera. And he would often say, like, even though Back Bay is doing great, they're less than a mile down the road from the South End and, and, um, and Roxbury, they, are, they will never reach their full potential if Roxbury it has, you can apply every disparity or every gap to the area, right? JP is never gonna be what it could be if Mattapan is suffering. And so that's one thing that everybody in this room who's watching, um, who's voting tomorrow, and then taking part every day thereafter in the civic life of this uh, city needs to understand is that no one up here, well, okay, I'll just say, Beckma is, uh, no, no one up here is just saying this is just for black people. I mean, of course, we're fighting on behalf of black people, again, as, as Sheena just mentioned, but you need to be able to see yourselves in these conversations too. This is not a black people conversation. Uh, this is something that benefits everybody uh, who's here. So uh, anyway, I just say that to say, this is why people beyond just black people should care about this. This is not something for you to check off on the box and say, I'm, now I'm an anti-racist because I supported this movement, but rather that you and your families and your children and children's children benefit when these disparities and these gaps no longer exist. So to tie it up, my goal is, I'm just tired of talking about these gaps. So that's my movement, is to get rid of them so we don't have to keep Stop talking, talking about, about the gaps. So I know we're at time, so I'm gonna let Amari close this, because but this is another question. It'll be the last one. But just to build on something, Willie, you, you said something really powerful, moving from rhetoric to action from rhetoric and talking about this to action. So Amari, maybe you can close this off. <laughs> Thinking about what is it that people at UMass Boston, people who are streaming and watching this conversation, what can we do now to build on what you all are doing? What can we do so that we can move from rhetoric to action? Did I put you on the spot? No, 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 no. That's a good question. And you know, and I think it's, I think it's related to our movement question. You know, we're, we're in this moment of these three pandemics, this economic pandemic, uh, this viral pandemic, and a, and a racial pandemic. And, and a lot of times when we think about doing good, this doing good means going to do something else with, with somewhere, someone else somewhere else. But this moment really calls for us to, to do work within. And so it, 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 you, you can't um, clean a playground up out of racial equity. You can't. Um, volunteer at a school and, and, and uh, read to a kid during a lunch hour to solve racial equity. You, you can't go to a senior center and, and speak to an elder adult to solve racial equity. This is, this is internal work. Um, this is work that you have to do um, within yourself and it counts. And so when I think about our movement and, and what folks in this room and, and outside who, who are watching can do, um, you know, our, our movement is, and, and if, if, if you guys were in an academic setting, you remember Maslow's uh, theory of need, food, shelter, closing at the, at the bottom, um, uh, safety in the, in the second layer, and then belonging, and then two other layers, self-actualization at the top. Uh, we, we live in the world where people don't think that food, shelter, clothing uh, is, is a right to all human beings. And so some of that requires us to, to change laws and policy to do something. And some of that requires us to change the hearts and minds of friends who work beside us, who live beside us, who live in our homes, to say that, that all human beings have a right to be here. They have a right to food, shelter, clothing. They have a right to safety, and they have a right to belonging. And so th that's the work that I would urge all of us to do is speak to our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, our, our family members, and, in, in, and do that mind-changing work do that mind shifting work. And that's, that's the start. It doesn't require us to volunteer anywhere. It doesn't require us to join a performative march down Blue Hill Ave and work your way up to uh, the park, uh, the Boston Common. It just requires us to, to look within. And so that's how, I, that's how I would leave us. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. I think you've left us all a lot to, to digest and think about. Um, and I'm just so grateful to each of you for spending this time. It's very hard to get these four individuals <laughs> together on, in one space. So I'm just really appreciative of your friendship and for doing this work that, that takes courage um, and true leadership and love. It takes a lot of love. Um, so thank you again for joining us.